Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to class number four out of five. I thought we would start again as our custom to read the prayer of the, of the Mass for St. Uh, Apollinaris, uh, kind of an obscure saint, uh, but I'll tell you more about him after the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Direct your faithful Lord in the way of eternal salvation, which the Bishop St. Apollinaris showed by his teaching and martyrdom, and grant through his intercession that we may so persevere in keeping your commandments as to merit being crowned with him. Through our, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. So St. Apollinaris, not a lot is known about him. He was a first or second century bishop uh, in the area of Ravenna. And uh, the only thing that we really have on him, apart from stories written about him in fragmentary form, is a church that's 1,500 years old, one of the basilicas of Ravenna. Many of the churches were destroyed in the wars uh, in that area, but this basilica, though damaged, the front uh, altar has a mosaic of St. Apollinaris. And he was a martyr because he was a pain in the neck to the local <laughs> Roman authorities. And he underwent many uh, tortures, exile, would come back, uh, and eventually was tortured uh, in, in ghastly ways and eventually died. He's, he was known for healing, though, miraculous healings of people, and he's the patron saint of people who suffer with gout and epilepsy. And so we remember him today as one of the great heroes of the faith, an early bishop and martyr uh, uh, in the early days when Rome was still a pagan society. So that's a little snippet on St. Apollinaris, bishop and martyr. So we're now in our fourth class, so good news, we're downhill now. We've kind of been heavy going uh, through the first three classes. And our theme is water into wine, how uh, Christianity can transform pagan cultures. And in the first couple of classes, we looked at how pagan ways of thinking and mythologies and philosophies not only were prevalent in those societies but show up in today's culture. And uh, in the last class then we spent some time just talking about uh, the culture that Christianity was born into, namely the world of Rome and some of the persecutions and uh, approaches that came out of that. Tonight we're going to talk about the primacy of Jesus Christ, but in the context of the world that Christianity was born into from a spiritual point of view, a theological uh, point of view, and how we see the beginning of the transformation of cultures uh, of those times that also will have uh, parallels for today, which you'll see. So if we jump through to this first slide, uh, if you think about Christianity in the first couple of centuries, it, it faced the problems that any new organization faces. Uh, and in particular, coming out of the Jewish tradition, uh, it had to face the core question of, is Christianity just a continuation of Judaism, just with a new prophet? Uh, is there anything really distinctive about it beyond that? And as you know from the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and Paul briefly quarreled about this uh, at the Council of Jerusalem and what emerged among other things is that Christianity is for all not tied to an ethnicity not tied to a geography Jerusalem uh, but rather it is a universal faith another issue that came out uh, in the first couple of centuries is who is Jesus Christ he, he did these wondrous things he did things that only God could do. He forgave sins on behalf of God, as if he was God, as if he was the offended party. Incredible. And more striking, he rose from the dead. So that we affirm with St. Paul, if Jesus Christ doesn't rise from the dead, your faith is in vain. So these elements of Jesus' public life, emphasis on public life, so no secrets, uh, 
on these two things uh, astounded the early believers, and they had to explain it. How was Jesus God and man? Was he God in the first place? In what sense was he God? In what sense was he a human being? Was he just play acting uh, at being human? And so these questions uh, percolated for centuries. And think about the church in those days. There wasn't the organizational structure to communicate comprehensively to every Christian member. What it meant to be a Christian was even still being worked out. So uh, we, we shouldn't read back into it, well, why did they allow all these different things to go on? Well, they had no choice. They, communication, which today is instantaneous, uh, would take days, weeks, and months in the ancient world. Another element of this time is Greek philosophy and philosophical inquiry in general. How do we make the faith understandable? This is not a cult or a mystery religion where there are secrets like some of the Gnostic religions of the time, but rather we are evangelizing the world. So how do we make this intelligible to people from other cultures and other languages even? And then lastly, what was dominant is a heresy called Gnosticism at the time. Now, Gnostic thought predated the arrival of Jesus Christ. There are elements of it in Plato. There are elements of it in the Oriental religions of the East, which would eventually determine its fundamental character. Uh, and so all of this framework, this, this cosmology of Greek philosophy mixed with the Oriental religions of the East, which we've touched on, uh, pre-existed and influenced how people received the revelation of Jesus Christ and how they mangled it to fit that cosmological grid versus being open to what Jesus Christ is revealing. So let's take a look at that a little more closely. So Gnosticism, Gnosis, uh, comes from a Greek word meaning knowledge. But it doesn't mean knowledge in the sense we might think about it in terms of analysis of an object separate from me. Like if I was analyzing molecules in chemistry or forces in physics, I'm being objective. I'm analyzing data, events. Uh, I'm taking measurements. That's not what the Gnostics meant by knowledge. They meant knowledge in the sense of intimacy with the other. Knowledge of the other is a mystical union of sorts. Uh, and they'd often point to, uh, for example, in Luke's Gospel, uh, how can this be? I do not know a man. When Mary responded to the angel, knowledge in the sense of intimacy was common currency in the Greek uh, model of Gnostics. But it also had this hue this flavor of the Eastern Oriental mystical union with what is known. I'm not just knowing it as an object. I'm knowing it as a union, intimately. Another tenet of the Gnostic philosophy, which was in the culture, is that the material universe is fallen, is an error in many ways. It is alien, and it's alien to the higher human spirit that's in all of us. Uh, it's imperfect. Uh, obviously, disasters happen, diseases happen. How can this be the effect of a good God? And so you see what comes from this is that there's this dualism that comes back of the good God could not possibly have created the world given how weird the world is, how flawed it is. So it must have been created by a different God, a, a bad, evil God. And the Gnostics will make a lot of... of pay out of what's in the Old Testament in particular, which is why they ultimately reject it. Namely, how can God's mind be changed uh, if he's going to slaughter the inhabitants of, the, of Nineveh? Or a flood that wipes out all of humanity except Noah? Or banishing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden? Wh what is going on there? Why would a good God wipe out you know, humanity with a flood? How could a, a good, eternal, infinite God be talked out of slaughtering uh, inhabitants of a town? This isn't the God that we think of that is good or all-knowing 
all loving, and so forth. So the Gnostics viewed the Old Testament as part of the bad God's revelation and rejected the Old Testament books ultimately as the ultimate source of revelation. And so you, Marcion was one of the early Gnostic heretics who rejected the Old Testament and re rejected Judaism as being revelatory in any sense. And so ultimately the Gnostics are going to affirm that our true home is in the spiritual world of the God beyond the God who created this world. And we'll say more about that in a moment. But they told complex stories and creation stories with this hierarchy of what they call eons. Eons are these intermediate forces or beings that mediate what's between us and the God beyond the God who created this world. So you see a polytheism exists, a dualism exists, uh, that there's a good God who's beyond all this, and there's an evil God who created all this. And I can't help pointing out the parallel to class one when we were reviewing Buddhism and Hinduism, where this world is to be overcome, this world is to be rejected in order to achieve a nirvana, uh, and so, too, this is some of the Eastern influences that creep in, even at this time, in, in ancient civilizations. And so, uh, more on that to come, but this dualism will also be extended to the human person. It's interesting how cosmologies always inform what it means to be human as well. And if you have a dualistic cosmology like this, good God, bad God created this world, you're going to reduce the human body as well, as mere tool, mere instrument of the true spiritual world, which we see today as we talked about with gender fluidity, with alternative sexual lifestyles. This is all part and parcel of this dualism that exists today, and a form of it existed at the time of early Christianity. So salvation consists of knowledge of this mystical kind. But because we have a spark of the spiritual, knowledge is ultimately a recovery or a recollection or memory, which is very uh, reminiscent of uh, Platonic thought, uh, not to go too deep, but in the Mino dialogue, Plato uh, outlines that knowledge is memory as well. So you see these cross currents and this is the culture that the ancient world was in, sifting through all these different cults, all these different gods, all these different philosophies. In the same way our culture today is sifting through, searching for meaning as well. And so salvation is this recovery of our spiritual selves that connect to this higher realm of being. Because in fact the good God created our true spiritual self and the bad God created our body for a Gnostic. So those who live the life of the spirit are saved. Those who die without the spirit of life will be placed in new bodies until they become perfect and attain salvation, reincarnation, which obviously uh, is central to Buddhism and Hinduism. But those who had the spirit of life and turn away will be eternally punished. So this is a predominant form of Christian gnosis, and I'm just telling you about that in particular. There were other schools of Gnostic belief as well. So who is Jesus for the Gnostic? Jesus is a special eon. He's not God. And in fact, he doesn't save us by dying on a cross, which is too carnal, too debasing, but rather saves us by creating uh, wisdom in us to not be deceived by the lower powers. He, he brings the light to us as being an eon of the spiritual God in this hierarchy, uh, but he doesn't save us by anything he did in his body other than speaking words of truth, but certainly not by dying on a cross. So you, you have these paradoxes uh, that the Gnostics seek to solve. And one of them is the problem of evil. And you solve that problem by saying, well, evil happens in this world because there's an evil God who causes it to happen against the wishes of the spiritual God. 
It, it, it solves the problem by destroying our experience of what evil is as well. So continuing with the threats that Gnosticism posed to Christianity, it really represents an effort to slot Jesus into a pre-existing cosmology, as I said, or to domesticate him, to not allow his life, death, and resurrection to get outside the lanes of what's acceptable and safe and fits the grid. Uh, and so I, I won't read through all this because we, we, I've covered a lot of this verbally, but uh, it does point to what uh, is happening today, which I will get to in a moment. But if you want a nice summary of Gnosticism, <coughs> it is the one true God really can't make contact with created reality. Can't be done. He cannot really come to us as God. This union of the spiritual in the capital S sense and the material is impossible. So keep that thought in mind. It's the essence of dualism, both for gods as well as for the human person. They, we really don't interconnect. And, and remember that as we go through. And so, you might say, okay, Charles, thank you for that kind of lesson from history, uh, but uh, how does this show up today? And, and how it shows up today is, um, you know, if you even believe there is a God, let's say you do, uh, but not much more than that. Kind of like many young people, they, they believe a, a God may exist, uh, they view him as maybe moralistic, just do the right thing. Um, they also might view him as kind of like a, a divine butler uh, who should help me when I ask him, a Jeeves on call. <laughs> uh, and, and then uh, lastly, there's kind of a, what I'll call a deistic sense of, but he's not really involved in the world. So moralistic, a divine butler, but he's not ultimately running anything in history or present or future. And, and that's based on some polling data by a, a sociologist who's not a Christian, just on what are attitudes of young people uh, toward God and religion. And those were the dominant responses of young people, which again are dualistic and in some ways Gnostic in their flavor. But this is the pagan framework uh, for today. There is maybe something out there, uh, but it's certainly, uh, it's like a beam of light that hits a prism and is, is refracted into all these different religions and movements and so forth. And for one, for Roy G. Biff, you remember that? That's the colors of a prism. So if red says, I'm the true light, the other color is going to say, what? No, you're not. And we standing back would say, no, light is many things. It's, it's Roy G. Biff. And so uh, to claim that one aspect of the light is uh, dominant or grounds the others or is light itself uh, seems a bit, as I said last class, arrogant, single-minded, uh, limited, and so forth. And, and that's the view in our culture today. And so uh, you have all of these different groups, some of which we've talked about. Uh, I include their atheism, which is kind of magic. We get something from nothing, which, you know, Marshall Brodeen couldn't do it any better if you remember him on Bozo Circus. <laughs> you know, pulling rabbits out of a hat uh, is basically the state of uh, current atheistic uh, astrophysics. We get something from nothing. We get multiverses from uh, fluctuations in a quantum field or nothing. That's what triggered the Big Bang and other multi So something from nothing. You know, fluctuations in a vacuum produce universes. Now there's n absolutely no evidence for that, but it's, it's a way of not dealing with the one infinity by positing many infinities. 
And, and so this would have fit right perfectly with the, the Gnostics of the early ancient world of, yeah, we postulate dualisms too. And mediations too. Forces as well to explain origin. Uh, so you see how these things come full circle. Now they're dressed up today in very advanced mathematics and other things, uh, but the Gnostics uh, had very advanced uh, Greek philosophy uh, that they were running with that isn't understood either. <laughs> so, uh, and the bumper sticker, of course, coexists. Uh, but from a Catholic point of view, how do we view this uh, landscape? And w the, how does Jesus fit in a Catholic point of view is that he is the revelation of the Father and he is the second person of the Trinity who assumed a human nature and came to earth. And that all graces to the world, past, present, and future, flow through Jesus Christ. He is the one mediator between God and man uniquely because he is God and man. And the next picture below Jesus Christ is, I believe it's a picture of Chart Cathedral, which is a beautiful cathedral. Uh, and this is where it gets spicy because we also affirm as Catholics that all graces that flow through Jesus Christ flow through the Roman Catholic Church and those churches and rites that are in union with the Roman Catholic uh, Church. Does that mean no grace is, is in existence outside that visible structure? No, it doesn't mean that. It means whatever grace there is in the world, whether it's in Tanzania or Thailand or Turkey or anywhere, that grace exists there in virtue of its mediation of Christ's body, the Catholic Church. So Jesus Christ is the source of all graces to the world and his instrument his body that conveys those graces is the Roman Catholic Church and those churches in union with it. So grace can occur outside but not without the Catholic Church. And that's the distinction Vatican II made uh, as well and it's one we affirm as Catholics. So this is a very distinctive claim but it's part of our faith uh, and, of course, it couldn't be otherwise if you really think about it. If you think about what the church is as the mystical bride of Christ, for Christ to have many bodies would be a kind of spiritual adultery. Christ has one body, one bride, the Catholic Church that he instituted on the backs of the apostles and their successors with Peter as their head. So... That's the claim. That's what we affirm as Catholics, and that's what's different about us from the pagan framework. We're not looking back and saying, well, Buddha had uh, a, a unique privilege perspective that we put Jesus next to as co-equals. Not at all. And in fact, uh, in uh, Fulton Sheen's book, Life of Christ, which I encourage you to read if you have not, but it was published, I'll say, in the 1950s, he mentions if God was going to send a messenger to speak on his behalf, given the clutter that exists on earth, wouldn't he do what any good marketing VP would do? Wouldn't he pre-announce his arrival? If, if Ford is introducing a new vehicle, and they are, uh, an F-150 electrical vehicle, they're making big announcements about it now. Wouldn't God do the same thing? Was Jesus' birth ever pre-announced? Was the city of Bethlehem ever mentioned anywhere? Was the manner of his death ever talked about in the Old Testament? Or being born of a virgin? Or being son of God? Yes, it was pre-announced. There are hundreds of references, and scholars have looked at this, that Jesus fulfills that are in the Old Testament. So he passes kind of the basic marketing 101 test that God if he wants to send a messenger, undoubtedly would, as any product manager would, pre-announce. Another test that Sheen talks about is it has to be reasonable. It can't do violence to our mind. We, we can't be asked to do something contradictory to reason. This sounds controversial, but there's nothing in the Catholic faith that is 
involves a contradiction or is contrary to reason. It might be above reason, the way writing the works of Shakespeare are above the nature of a pencil, but it's not a contradiction of the pencil to write to be or not to be. And so too nature, human nature can be elevated by grace to beautiful acts of virtue that but left to itself it could not do. So there is no contradiction in the faith as such. It's simply above what reason could find out on its own or do on its own. The final test is, and we touched on this briefly, but God's messenger identified the truth with his person. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Buddha pointed to the noble truths outside of himself. Every other character who appears on the stage of history it says, no, here's what I got from an angel in the woods, this book. Or I took this dictation down from uh, another higher being, pointing to something outside of themselves. Jesus' claim is remarkably and astonishingly different. I am the truth in my person. Only a God could make a claim like that. That was blasphemous to do so. It was blasphemous to forgive sins. <laughs> and it was startling to rise from the dead. So these are unique to Jesus Christ and our faith, and we should feel proud about it and good about it, that these are distinctive. Let's pivot a little bit to talk about, again, the world of, of the apostles and what they were facing in that culture and then how, again, that will connect to uh, today. Before I do, because this at times when I've gone through this in the past can be, uh, I didn't know that, Charles. I'm not sure how I feel about the Catholic Church being the unique body of Christ. Uh, I'll open it up for questions on this or, or other points. But uh, this is part of our faith. We affirm that Jesus Christ instituted the Catholic Church through the apostles. Yes. That's a fair point, uh, and uh, I think I ran out of room. No. Um, <laughs> I thought Gaia or Episcopalians, and I thought, well, they're kind of the same. Uh, no, oh, that's, oh, that's a, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But um, with, with Vatican II, we affirm that the Protestant faiths, Anglicanism on down, because they, can, from a hierarchy standpoint, they go down, you know, Anglicans, no Pope, Episcopalians, no bishops, Presbyterians, no bishops. Uh, Episcopalians have bishops but no Pope, like the Anglicans. Presbyterians have priests but no bishops. And then the Evangelicals have no priests. So there's kind of a, a you know, you go from Tiffany's down to uh, Walmart as you walk that, that chart. But... Um, Right. And so what Vatican II affirmed about Protestant religions is that they're, they're not churches in the technical sense. They are ecclesial communities. But they're not churches in the theological sense because the only church in the true sense of the word are, is the Catholic Church. It is the body of Christ. Now, we call Protestant faiths churches, but we use that term loosely uh, we don't mean that technically. They're technically not churches because other than baptism, their sacraments are not valid and their, their priesthoods, whatever form they are, or ministers are not valid ordinations. Unlike the Greek Orthodox, who might not be in union with Rome, but their ordinations are valid because they can be traced back to bishops and go back to apostolic men. Yes, one more question, then we have to... Right. So the on. circumstances of someone in Tibet right now, they may have never heard of Jesus Christ, uh, let alone the Catholic Church. They can be saved in virtue of following the true dictates of their conscience. But the grace that makes that possible is wrought, is achieved by Jesus Christ as the, the mystical union with the body of Christ, the Catholic Church. 
All right, a half question. <laughs> I think there was relief because the prior position was more, it was presented in a more us versus them point of view. Vatican II, in clarifying this, actually uh, gave people some uh, momentum that, oh, we're not cast out, uh, but rather grace is available to us outside the visible structures of the Catholic Church is the expression used. What's interesting about that expression, outside the visible structures, means that grace can pop up anywhere, anytime, in any culture, in any civilization, any geography. That's very important to affirm that clearly, which the Church did. In affirming that, it's not walking from that all grace flows through Jesus Christ and his body, the church. And the analogy I use is a fountain. Jesus is the water. The fountain is located in the center of town. And it overflows its banks and starts going down sidewalks, into gutters, everywhere. So, too, the water of God's grace flows outside that visible structure, but it certainly comes from that fountain. Let's press on. Okay, good. So there are two scenes from the Acts of the Apostles I want to touch on because they represent this encounter with Greek culture, Greek philosophy, which was prevalent at the time and in which really all philosophical and scientific inquiry comes from, even in our time. And the categories by which scientists of today and philosophers of today, to the extent they're even read, uh, operate out of. So I'll quickly read this scene from Acts of the Apostles. So Barnabas and Paul are now on the missionary trail in Lystra, which is somewhere in Turkey. At Lystra there was a crippled man lame from birth who never walked. He listened to Paul speaking who looked intently at him, saw that he had the faith to be healed and called out in a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. He jumped up and began to walk about. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they cried out in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in human form. They called Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes. Hermes was the interpreter of the gods, and it's where our word hermeneutics comes from, which is the science of interpretation. And so they called Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, for he, together with the people, intended to offer sacrifice. So they thought they were part of the Greek pantheon. They're slotted. They're safe. The apostle Barnabas and Paul tore their garments when they heard this and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We are of the same nature as you, human beings. We proclaim to you good news that you should turn from these idols to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all Gentiles to go their own ways. Yet in bestowing his goodness, he did not leave himself without witness, for he gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, and you filled with nourishment and gladness for your hearts. So even nature can communicate properly understood the existence and sovereignty of God without revelation. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. However, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, they got up and entered the city. On the following day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. So evidently they stoned Paul, but not Barnabas. <laughs> so it's interesting, the Greeks wanted to offer them sacrifice uh, because they fit the expectation. They wanted to worship them in some ways. But after a while, they let the Jews from Antioch come and stone Paul to the point of death. So they were ultimately fine with him being killed if he was a troublemaker after all. So it's interesting how he was received. Another one, Paul at Athens. And this is a very uh, rich text. And in fact, John Paul II, when he was uh, 
archbishop in Poland gave a series of lectures just on this passage, uh, like six or seven lectures, uh, and a book was made out of those lectures, which was very interesting. In any event, Paul at Athens, the seat of Greek philosophy, of the schools, the academy, the peripatetics, the porches of the Stoics, they were all there. In fact, uh, Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor of the second century, founded four chairs of philosophy in Athens. The Stoics, uh, the Plato, Plato, Aristotle, and uh, the, uh, the fourth one will come to me later. The Epicurious, Epicurean school. So it was the seat, it was, it was the Harvard of the time, so to speak, except they were literate in Athens. <laughs> so, quote, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he grew exasperated at the sight of the city full of idols. So he debated in the synagogue with the Jews and with the worshipers and daily in the public square with whoever happened to be there. Even some, of the, even some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion. Some asked, what is this scavenger trying to say? <laughs> Others said, he sounds like a promoter of foreign deities, which they would mean by that Eastern, because he was preaching about Jesus and resurrection. They took him and led him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn what this new teaching is that you speak of? So they're curious. For you bring some strange notions to our ears. We should like to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners residing there, use their time for nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Kind of like today. We're into the latest feed on our phone of a news story or what have you. Uh, we hear a jingle on our phone, we immediately look at it. We might be driving when we're tempted to look at it. So we're into what's new. What am I missing? So here was what Paul said to them. Then Paul stood up at the Areopagus and said, You Athenians, I see that in every respect you are very religious. For as I walked around looking carefully at your shrines, I even discovered an altar inscribed to an unknown God. What therefore you unknowingly worship, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all that is in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in sanctuaries made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands because he needs anything. Rather, it is he who gives everyone life and breath and everything. He made from one the whole human race to dwell on the entire surface of the earth, and he fixed the order of seasons and the boundaries of their regions, so that the people might seek God, even perhaps grope for him, and find him, though indeed he is not far from any one of us. If I pause here, note that Paul is directly confronting the Gnostic myth that this world was created by an evil god or a lower god, which would have been in this air then. He's saying, no, God is not far from you. He's near. He's not in some beyond that's unreachable. So let me tell you about what this god did. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since therefore we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divinity is like an image fashioned from gold, silver, or stone by human art and imagination. God has overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he demands that all people everywhere repent because he has established a day on which he will judge the world with justice. Through a man he has appointed and he has provided confirmation for all by raising him from the dead. When they heard about resurrection of the dead, some began to scoff, but others said, we should like to hear you on this some other time. And so Paul left them, but some did join him and became believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the, of the court of the Areopagus, a woman named Damaris and others with them. So you see the reception at Athens. Paul starts by where they are, uh, by linking God and the revelation of Jesus Christ to their unknown God, who incidentally, uh, scholars uh, assess, 
was a, a God that would rise and die with the seasons. And so Paul may have known that and was attempting to elaborate that. So he links it to their unknown God. But you can see with the influence of Platonic philosophy that emphasized the universal over the particular, the spiritual over the material, not in a toxic way that the Gnostics would, but that the spiritual realm is higher than the material realm, resurrection of the dead would not be received well. It would, it would appear to be too gaudy, too, uh, as I said, carnal, too dirty, too a, a lower part somehow saves a higher part. That's a reverse of how things really go. And so they couldn't accept that resurrection from the dead uh, as even uh, an engine of redemption or salvation or knowledge or illumination. Also, what would be odd to them, and we touched on this in past classes, is assigning to one person in history all of this is odd, disproportionate, heavy-handed, closed-minded. All you Eastern religious types are always doing this. It's my guy and no one else. Uh, whereas Greek, the Greek mind was much more open to the universality of reason and what it can discover how can the universal be particularized in this one man from Nazareth? It doesn't make any sense. So we will hear you on this another time. And in the sub-bullet, I mentioned just a, a note that we, we won't necessarily have to dwell on, but it's a problem that hits us today that I've talked about again, is by preaching Jesus Christ today and evangelizing, unbelievers, they will react in a similar way. How can you say that this particular figure in this particular moment of time, in this particular culture, can be universal for the world? How can that be? It, it, it seems unbelievable. So think about that for a moment, but the egalitarianism of our culture resists saying it's this man. As, as you know, for when you've attended these classes, I really, uh, I really like uh, Pope Benedict uh, and Cardinal Ratzinger as a theologian and an explainer of the faith in the modern world. And uh, he wrote a book that's in the bibliography uh, called The Introduction to Christianity. It's not really an introduction. It's heavy going, but it's, it's quite good. And it was written in the late 60s, after the student riots, after the bloom was off the rose, so to speak, of many of the implementations of Vatican II that were failing at the time. And he, at the university he was at, the students had rioted and broken windows and buildings, and he thought, I, I better kind of take a step back here and write uh, an assessment of Christianity for the modern world, which is exactly what he did. And he mentions this very issue, uh, which I stole from him uh, for this class and past classes in past years. Namely, the particular revealing the infinite is contrary to our sensibility. This is why Buddhism is so appealing, because I can, I can reflect universally on my experience and detach through various techniques of meditation and self-denial and other things and erase what's particular about me to plug into this universal spirit that leads to nirvana. And, and that's attractive. There are a lot of Christian yoga centers opening up in, in, in this country or elsewhere. But you see this in the slogans, I'm spiritual, not religious. Religion divides, the spirit unites. It's all the same God in the end. This is in the air. And so Pope Benedict, then uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, or even Father Ratzinger, uh, he asked the question, did Jesus create too large a stumbling block in appearing in history in the first place, in being vulnerable, being available? He could be touched. The woman's hemorrhage could be cured by touching his cloak. In a specific history, 
out of the tradition of Judaism in the Roman world. Quote, the leap which previously led into the infinite seems to have been reduced to something on a human scale. And that we now need only take the few steps, as it were, to that person in Galilee in whom God himself comes to meet us. But things are curiously double-sided. What at first seems to be the most radical revelation, the revelation is at the same moment the cause of the most obs extreme obscurity and concealment. The very thing which at first seems to bring God quite close to us, Jesus in the flesh, so that we can touch him as a fellow man, follow his footsteps and measure them precisely, also became in a very pro profound sense the precondition for the death of God, which henceforth puts an eradicable stamp on the course of history and the human relationship with God. God has become so near to us that we can kill him. Think of Frederick Nietzsche and the death of God uh, claim and, and the philosophy and culture that gets launched from that thinking which we now inhabit. Continuing, thus today we stand somewhat baffled before this Christian revelation and wonder, especially when we compare it with the re religiosity of Asia, whether it would not have been much simpler to believe in the mysterious eternal, entrusting ourselves to it in longing thought, whether God would not have done better to leave us at an infinite distance, whether it would not really be easier to ascend out of the world and hear the eternally unfathomable secret in quiet contemplation than to give oneself up to belief in one single figure and to set the salvation of man and of the world on the pinpoint of this one chance moment in history. Surely a God thus narrowed down to one point is bound to die definitively in a view of the world which remorselessly reduces man and his history to a tiny grain of dust in the cosmos. A beautiful passage. You see what he's after? See what he's up to? It, it, apparently, we, we often in our trouble say, where is God? Why does he appear so distant? And then he comes to us in Jesus Christ and in the corporate Christ, which is the church, through the sacraments, the mass, the examples of holy men and women, and it's too close. It can't be right. <laughs> We're not happy either way, it seems. So wouldn't it be simpler and safer, Pope Benedict says, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, if he just remained eternally distant? And we come to him just through quiet meditation, fumbling our way, much like the religions of Asia. And the beautiful aspect of this is the irony in it. Of, of course not. God chose to reveal himself in Jesus Christ. That's the astonishing claim of Christianity. That's the strangeness of Christianity. And the rest of the world, including members in the Catholic Church want to domesticate that. We have to retain the strangeness of a God who suffered, died, and rose. Okay. If we continue, and there are many texts that uh, affirm the claims that we make as Catholics, but look at what Paul says in the letter to the Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So Paul even affirms that the existence of an intermediate realm, angels, good angels, and bad angels, all subject to Jesus Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians is thought to have been written 
later than Acts of the Apostles. And you will see in other places, uh, after that experience in Athens, where Paul had some rough treatment from the academics, he said, well, I'm just going to resolve to preach Christ crucified and nothing else. <laughs> because he had tried the academic argument. It didn't meet with much success. So he says, okay, I'm really going to stick my finger in the eye of culture then. I'm going to change tact. And I'm just going to talk about how the crucified Jesus saves us, which would be really ratcheting it up Instead of saying, yeah, Jesus is like your unknown God. Let me tell you about him. And then when he gets to the resurrection, they're like, so I'm just going to start with Jesus crucified. So there was a change in pastoral strategy for the times. Or in the Philippians, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Some translations are snatched to to convey the sense of how Adam and Eve snatched the fruit from the tree to gain gnosis, knowledge. And so, equality with God is not an act of violence or a rupture, but rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found in human appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There it is again. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see in these texts, and I'll read one more, not the whole thing, but you have it for reference. The Gospel of John starts with, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on, how the Word, uh, all things come to be, you know, paralleling Paul. Uh, he's the light of life, the light of the human race, full of grace and truth. And then later in John, we have the I am statements in John throughout. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. And we have that passage here. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Very carnal. It sounds cannibalistic to pagans in some ways. And early Christians were accused of cannibalism incorrectly. I would also add, this is where the biblical manuscripts that they continue to find in the Middle East are interesting because John, which is considered to be a later gospel uh, and a more mature theological reflection on the life of Jesus, uh, there are many different variants of or versions of John. And what's interesting is the orthodox text that was accepted by early Christianity predominantly uh, was the one that had the carnal references. Because you have this identical passage without eat, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Because you had certain early Gnostics who might have been Christian, they thought, who wanted to remove all the references to uh, bodily uh, activity. Even if you compare Jesus' words on the cross in John's Gospel with the other Gospels. So you have in uh, Matthew, and I believe it's Mark, you know, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, this cry, this plaintive cry in humiliation. In John, you have the consummatum est. It is finished. Wow. <laughs> That's one reaction to being nailed on the cross. But it's capturing uh, with this hue, because uh, the Gnostic version of that was even more minimalistic. Uh, but even in John, you have this, Jesus is in control of all events. Which is an interesting, uh, again, refraction of that light of the prison 
prism of the gospel writers remembering and writing for their context uh, what Jesus said on the cross. And in fact, again, Bishop Sheen, Fulton Sheen, uh, wrote a book on the, the seven last words of Jesus, reviewing these gospel uh, variations on what Jesus said. In Luke, you have Jesus with the good thief and the bad thief story. The other gospels don't narrate that story. Does it mean it didn't happen? No. It, it, the gospels together form this holistic view of, of the lives and events of Jesus uh, in his earthly ministry and then the post-resurrection stories. So we shouldn't put ourselves in the position of saying, well, someone got it wrong. Rather, these people who wrote the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the communities they were part of, they're writing for a purpose, for a particular point in time, for a particular kind of community. Luke was a physician, so much of what he wrote has medical stories and analogies that Jesus said and did. So. Uh, we could go on and on with this, but it, it's interesting to note that in the, the different manuscripts of John that exist that the church rejected, they all airbrush out the carnal aspects of Jesus' ministry. And the orthodox reception of John uh, was keeping them in. So much for Bible-only faiths, by the way, because the institution that did that sorting and selection, if it's not spirit-guided, how do we know that the version of John that was selected was authentic to the life of Jesus? So I've said this before, but any belief in the Bible as inspired word of God, as we affirm as Catholics, as it relates to our salvation, implies the institution that selected the texts was also inspired by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we have no guarantee that uh, the works selected are true to the life of Jesus. So try that one on your evangelical friends next time. <laughs> but again, I put it many different ways. Who wrote the table of contents in the Bible? Ask it that way. <laughs> but as I say, you will get the, the calculator divided by zero look. You, you'll get, you know, what kind of question is that? But Think about it for a moment. Who, who selected the text? Okay. Uh, continuing then, so the question is not how Jesus fits into a pagan framework. Not at all. For Catholics, the question is how we fit <laughs> into a Christocentric universe that was pre-configured by the logos, which is a Greek word for word or rationality, or expression. So the universe is pre-wired from all eternity by the second person of the Trinity who then reveals God to us definitively when he comes in a particular time and place and then institutes the Catholic Church to continue his message and ministry to the world. What's interesting about Jesus, and I put it in bold here, but I, I want to try something with you, because uh, I've said this before in the past, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a difficult concept. But what makes Jesus ultimately unique is he is what he mediates. All other human experience we have, our knowledge, our loves, are mediated by some other go-between, which is what mediator means. Uh, so my knowledge that, let's say, Milwaukee is 40 miles, 50 miles north of Lake Forest is mediated by my sensory experience of going north on 41 or 94, going to Milwaukee. It's mediated by my conceptual and my imagination, that is, images of driving that highway. I don't have a chunk of the highway in my mind. <laughs> Rather, I conceptualize it. I can imagine it. Or think of an example of a triangle. You can imagine that it has three sides. You can imagine and conceptualize that its interior angles, I hope, equal 180 degrees. <laughs> but it's mediated knowledge. I don't have a triangle stuck in my brain physically. 
And love is like that too. My love for my wife or my husband is mediated by my physical circumstances. Often love can't even be expressed in words. Poets try to do that. But there's always mediation. If I love you, I will take out the garbage. <laughs> Not just words, but I will do it. I will <laughs> express it. Only if it's my garbage. No. <laughs> so all human experience is mediated. Everything. In Jesus Christ, he is what he mediates. This is unique to, to Jesus. He bridges the gap. He creates true intimacy with him for that reason. True intimacy with God. That's why we worship him, reverence him. He is this unique mediator. What he says is what is being expressed. The Logos is what it expresses. It enables what it is. The that by which is the that which. And this is what makes Jesus different. And for the philosophically minded, it is the union of truth, absolute truth, and history, which befuddled the ancients. This was one of the paradoxes of the ancient world and of our time as well. How do we get our arms around what is that which gives meaning? And we always have to have a vehicle, which is not what we're trying to get to. The Buddhist has to lobotomize themselves spiritually before they can make contact with nirvana. We have to lop something off. And, and Jesus is saying no. True intimacy with God can actually happen, can actually occur. But it occurs with Paul and with the apostles through the death and resurrection. It's not, as I say here, a set of doctrines first. It leads to that, of course. We want to understand what we love. But it is a person that we love. As I say, no one gives their life for a syllogism only out of love for a person. So why the Paschal Mystery? Why does Jesus have to suffer and die? Which is a common complaint from pagan society today. If you read the atheist, the new atheist writers, which are not so new, <laughs> uh, why this grotesque suffer and die and rise thing? But the truth, as we say with St. Paul, is this is a fundamental holy fact of Christianity, that Jesus died and rose that he conquered sin and death. And this falls part and parcel with Jesus coming to this world as part of a Jewish tradition, which is our elder brothers in the faith. That we are in continuity with the Jewish people and the Jewish faith, as described in the Old Testament. In Leviticus, which is a, the Feast of Yom Kippur, the uh, Feast of, of the Atonement, a scapegoat is slaughtered, its blood, blood sprinkled on the altar to atone for the people's sin. Later in Exodus, we remember the story, or the movie, uh, of a one-year-old lamb slain, male, without blemish, and the blood sprinkled on the doorposts to protect the firstborn. In the letter to the Hebrews, Paul describes Jesus as the high priest and victim. Another example of he is what he enacts. He is priest and victim. Now the sins are not forgiven by the blood of animals, but by Jesus himself, sent by the Father to atone. There are traces of this in the Greeks. The Greek philosophical tradition, which elements of it are in some of the stories that Jesus tells his parables about the grain of wheat must die. But if you think about it, and uh, another wonderful uh, hero of mine, Fulton Sheen, would often talk about this on the level of nature. And the way he described it 
in uh, various retreats he used to give um, is a birth of a higher life requires death of a lower life. And he talks about if plants could talk to minerals, they would say, would you like a higher life? Would you like the ability to grow, uh, experience nutrition, and reproduce into other plants? And the minerals would say, yeah, I, I would like to know what that higher life is. So the plants have to digest, absorb minerals to grow. And so too, animals might say to plants, would you like the ability to move, move around, not be stuck in the ground, reproduce, see, color, shapes, run with excitement? And the plants would say, yes, I would like a higher life. Well, they have to be eaten and digested. So too, <coughs> we as human beings say to animals in this poetic uh, exposition, would you like the ability to form concepts, to write music and poetry, to play music, to write books, to build cathedrals, to think about eternity? And the animal says, yes, I will give you my nature and my life to achieve a higher life like that. And so the animal is slaughtered. And so too, God says to us, will you give me your human nature? Would you like a higher life? And not coercively, like the way Zeus or the other Greek gods would approach humanity with sexual exploit or deception, but rather, God came to a virgin kneeling in prayer and said, will you give me a human nature? Asked her, will you give me a human nature? And she agreed. And so our salvation was launched. You see how strange Christianity is, how bizarre that would be to the pagan mind that God asked permission to be given a human nature. Whereas all the other mythologies of the time, God would deceive humanity to enter the world. So this launches the incarnation, Mary's yes. And Mary's also at the foot of the cross as well. And so I'd like to wrap up this part of the primacy of Jesus with a poem written in the 19th century There is a man on the cross. Whenever there is silence around me, by day or by night, I'm startled by a cry. It came down from the cross the first time I heard it. I went out and searched and found a man in the throes of crucifixion. And I said, I will take you down. And I tried to take the nails out of his feet. But he said, let them be, for I cannot be taken down until every man, every woman, and every child come together to take me down. And I said, but I cannot bear your cry. What can I do? And he said, go about the world. Tell everyone that you meet there is a man on the cross. Jesus makes contact with us. God makes contact with us by emptying himself suffering, dying, and rising. This is the primacy of Jesus. So with that, we have time for a few comments or questions. I prefer the approach that the Gospels reflect the full measure of what John and the other apostles heard and saw. Because no one person, thankfully, is why we have four Gospels, captures everything that occurred. And so I don't view the statements, because two of them are almost identical, Matthew and, and Mark. 
Luke adds the story of the good thief and the bad thief. And John, who describes Jesus as really in control at all times. Uh, in John's gospel, we have those expressions of, he did this so that, or he knew the Pharisees were doubting, uh, and so forth. There's always an editor in John commenting on, Jesus acted that way so that they would believe. And there's this almost person looking on top in John's gospel. And so, too, John has those famous words, it is finished. And it wasn't captured by the other writers. Maybe they had left because they were in shame or uh, embarrassed or they just left. And John is there with Mary and the other Mary. So not conflict, but diversity. So it's interesting. There's many texts and some of them are earlier, like uh, the Gospel of Thomas is thought to be one of the early ones, perhaps end of first century, early second century, perhaps later. What was interesting is the Gospel of Judas uh, was discovered uh, in Egypt in, in the 1940s in Coptic, which was an Egyptian form of Greek, a vernacular in Egypt. Around the mid-third century is when the manuscript is dated, but it's referring to other texts in fragmentary form from earlier. And so you could say that the bulk of the Gnostic Gospels or texts, as we have them so far, are somewhere between, let's say, 125 A.D. to 400 A.D., something like that. You have fragments, though, that... So I'm talking about, like, let's say, complete Gospels. You have fragments that, are, that can be earlier than that date range because Gnostics existed prior Yes? Two things. How would Matthew, Mark, and Luke know anything about the crucifixion anyway because they weren't there? Well, maybe they were off in the distance. But we, we, don't, we have to be careful they weren't there saying that definitively. But maybe they talked to someone who was there even. Okay. Uh, maybe they talked to John. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind that uh, omission doesn't mean absence. So the fact that the Gospels don't say everything doesn't mean it didn't happen. Because even as John says at the end of his Gospel, everything Jesus said and did couldn't be contained in all the books in the world. So uh, we, we have to always be careful on, on concluding too much from absence in a text. Yeah, and Luke yeah. talks about that at the beginning of his gospel. He says, I've, I want to write an account that is comprehensive and true, and I've talked to the various witnesses, and then he begins. And you think of the story of Peter and John running to the empty tomb, uh, and the story that precedes that is Mary Magdalene, who must have told them uh, about her experience, and John wrote that down. Yes, is this can sound unsettling. Uh, is the Gospel of Luke that we have or the Gospel of Mark from the hand of the author? And fundamentally, the answer is define author. Uh, if you think that the, the parchment that Mark wrote on, we now have in the British Museum in London, we don't. We have no manuscript from the hand of any author. What do we have? We have copies and different versions of those original texts. And scholars will write long books showing this genealogy of the original texts, which are in question marks, and then the children texts and manuscripts that flow from them. And those they have. And so then they, the, the work of these scholars is to piece back what was the original text just like you would try to piece back with 23andMe, <laughs> what did my great, 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 great grandfather look like? And uh, that's a strained analogy, but you, you see that the problem is. But that should not uh, trouble us as Catholics because we say with St. Augustine, who faced this problem, 
I believe these books that we have are the holy inspired word of God because the church says so. Because the apostles and their successors sifted through them and said, no, this version corresponds to what I remember Jesus saying and doing. Or, if you're St. Polycarp, successor of John, you can say, John told me about what Jesus said on the cross. You see how rich the Catholic tradition, sacred tradition, actually is. The book by itself is inadequate in terms of establishing itself. It's obviously the word of God as we believe as Catholics. But how it became the word of God requires the apostolic, the spirit-guided apostolic tradition who formed the book and the text and said, these versions correspond to what Jesus said and did, and these ones do not. Yes? But then when you point up at the final versions that we have today, we have examples like they tore their garments right. in anger or whatever. When, why are, today, are they afraid to then edit that, to put it in today's right. terminology that it, you know, gets the wonder of right. change over? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough problem. Translation is a tough problem because you, you, you have to do two things at the same time. And as you know from knowing other languages, sometimes you don't have a one-to-one -one good translation. Now, extend that over 2,000 years. And, and, but the problems they're trying to solve is how do I communicate this in, in language for today while keeping the original meaning? And Remember in the 70s, the Good News Bible came out and the, and the uh, Recycle Now Bible came out and, and, and they were terrible Bibles because they, they were not inspiring. It was too, uh, it, it was too uh, you know, almost vaudeville. It was just too much in our language. And, and so we, we lack the majesty and reverence and solemnity of, of the real meaning of the words. And uh, so this is the challenge that translators have. How do I render the text accurately, but in today's language? And that's a hard thing, especially when there are concepts from the ancient world that don't have easy English equivalents. Yes? I'm getting more confused. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Correct. Don't, don't be confused. I hope there's nothing I said that would lead you to think that someone was at the elbow of Jesus. Uh, so c was there five loaves and two fishes or two fishes and five loaves? Can you slow down? Well, or when you're talking about John, it sounds like he had written it. And I thought, I don't think most of the apostles could probably even read the night. But, but think about you know, again, the ancient world, and think about, uh, so Jesus dies. The, the apostles are hiding. <laughs> he rises. Uh, they then start preaching and evangelizing after Pentecost. Uh, they're not writing anything down at that point. They're, they're, they actually think maybe the world will end in that generation or the next generation, and that's all over Paul as well that the coming wrath, as I talked about in First Thessalonians, or uh, the end of the world conversations. Uh, so why write anything down? So the first text that we think we have as a fragment is First Thessalonians, around 51, 52, 53 AD is when people think that was written. We've got fragments from the first century. But the first complete codex, which is a book, is the Codex Sineaticus and the Codex Vaticanus from the mid fourth century and into the fifth century. Those are the first books that we actually have in complete form. And so, uh, but people started writing stuff down when uh, A, Jesus didn't come right away, and B, the apostles were starting to die. And the key witnesses of Jesus were passing away. So they said, we better get this written down accurately. John, yeah. the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, as we know it now, 
In what century was that final compilation made? Sure. Um, so the official designation was at the Council of Trent, and that was in 1545 to 1563. Okay, so but the books of the New Testament, for example, or the Gospels, Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon in 175 AD, provides a list of these are the books of the New Testament. These are the Gospels. You have a canon by a local assembly called the Muratorian Canon in around 386 AD, list all 27 books of the New Testament. But there, yes, and there was disputes on the Old Testament that raged much longer. And we have our text from the Septuagint, which is the Greek version written by the Diaspora Jews uh, who knew Greek. And it has the full 45 books. Then you have from the Council of Jamnia, the Jews in reaction to the Christians says, well, we're, we're going to establish our list, which has the 39, which is the list that Luther eventually picks later in the Protestant Reformation, the 39 books, which is why our Catholic Old Testament has six more books than the Protestant Old Testament. But there's this sifting out historical process. But again, think of communication back then. Think of time, the time it took to travel. If there was a controversy happening somewhere 500 miles away, you might not hear about it for two months. If they're using bogus texts, you wouldn't know about it, let alone the Bishop of Rome, who was hiding in the streets. The first 21 popes were martyred. You know, it wasn't a very good job. <laughs> so. We, we, can't ass we can't assign uh, this communication structure of today to 2,000 years ago. There was the sifting out process. In the church under persecution for 300 years, you couldn't exactly get together publicly <laughs> in a big group to hash it all out. That had to wait for Constantine. Thank you for hanging in. We'll see you next week. <laughs>